Um, excuse me, sir. I can't breathe. I'm not sure if you can hear me either. But it's a music. Wayne, we can't hear you.
so hopefully I remember that trick for next time. Um, yeah, so I was saying very sterile is a target for antibiotics um, for antifungal drugs. So we'll come back to that a little bit later on, but you're going to see there's a theme, right? When the microbe is different from us, uh, that means it has a vulnerability. So you might have a drug that uh, uh, affects their physiology and not ours. So a little bit more on that later. Like I said, I think that's topic 10. Uh, so we have a little bit of time to kind of come back to that. So uh, I don't know how many species of fungi are out there. I don't think even the mycologists know how many species of fungi are out there. Uh, but uh, I think the last number I saw was something like, you know, at least 100,000 different species out there. Um, a lot of them are decomposers. Uh, so hugely important uh, part of the, uh, of the ecosystem. And uh, some of them cause diseases in animals, plants, and otherwise. In fact, uh, if you're a farmer, uh, you may be more concerned about fungi than the average person. You can see uh, this is showing a mushroom. And uh, one thing that you may or may not know about mushrooms is what you see above ground is often just a little small part of the actual organism. Uh, there are some mushrooms that literally the organism is underground and it's like the size of, you know, a soccer field or something like that. There are a, a number of them like that. So a couple of things I've already said, they secrete enzymes. Um, and uh, something that uh, a lot of fungi have are these structures here, which are called hyphae. So these are kind of like these little finger-like uh, structures and they branch and that's what's secreting the enzymes and that's what is going to be invading um, whatever it's eating. So Linda just arrived. Yeah, I saw her, but she I had her pen too. Oh, I changed the tip on it. Okay. Hopefully it'll work. Thank you. So um, that's what's secreting the enzymes and that's what's invading things. So it could be invading the dirt, it could be invading an old log, or it could be invading your skin. And so if you have a fungal infection, you might get itchy or worse uh, because those little hyphae are getting in there and causing irritations. Uh, a mass of these hyphae are called mycelium. So you, a, a lot of technical terms here, but just remember anytime you see MYC, that means it has something to do with fungi. So mycology, remember way back in our first lecture, what was mycology? Yeah, the study of fungi and yeast and things like that, right? So, Anytime you see mite, it means something to do with a, a fungal something or another. Uh, here's some pictures of these uh, mycelium here. And uh, uh, this, is, uh, I think this is from a textbook. Maybe not the best picture, but you can see it's kind of invading. It looks like some sort of tissue or, or cell culture or something like that. So, hmm, interesting. What did I do there? I must have uh, got to get a better clicker. So one more word to know is this one here, postoria. Uh, postoria, if you take a look at this little diagram, here's a hyphae. And, uh, and, and some of the hyphae even have further branches. And these hostoria are really uh, what are found on pathogenic fungi that are infecting tissues such as skin. And uh, I think um, I have another slide about this here. Uh, there is some of these... Um, um, some of these fungi uh, do some interesting things. In fact, there's some of these fungi happen to be uh, a predatory. So I remember learning about this years ago. There's an X-Files episode about this. If you don't know or you're not familiar with the X-Files, it's about FBI agents who investigate uh, paranormal and weird things. And there's sometimes monsters and things like that. And there was some fungi that was, uh, that was eating people, right? So it actually sits in the, in, um, this, the, the people eating one is not real. <laughs> Uh, but worm eating one, so the worm will go through the soil and the fungi, it's kind of like a little bit of a snare or, or a lasso, it grabs onto them and the, uh, the hostoria will get into its tissues, inject digestive enzymes and whatnot. So you can imagine the X-Files episode was kind of horrifying. Um, Blaine? Yes. Uh, we have lost your screen, your PowerPoint. We don't have it. Okay, okay thank you. Let's try that again. I must have unshared somehow. Yeah, okay. I think. Okay, so what else can we say about fungi? A uh, whole bunch of different forms. I mentioned the mushrooms already. 
Uh, mushrooms aren't usually so important to infections. Uh, you know, we don't usually have mushrooms growing on our heads or anything like that uh, that I know of. Uh, but these other forms of fungi are really important medically. So you can see I've got molds and yeast and dimorphic, and I'll talk about what those are again. Uh, the mushrooms are the things that most people are familiar with because obviously we see them, sometimes we eat them. Uh, and that what you're seeing, like I said, that kind of fleshy part, the mushroom part, uh, can be actually a small part of the actual organism. So I think I have a slide for each of these. One thing you may know if you eat mushrooms, and you may have heard, you know, don't eat them out in the wild if you don't know what you're doing. Um, apparently, there are not a lot of poisonous mushrooms out there, but the ones that are, are like super toxic. So this one here apparently is, uh, is one of the worst. It's called the death cap. <laughs> so with a name like that, you can imagine it's super poisonous. Uh, found... Um, I'm not exactly sure where it's found. My understanding is that you can find it in some parts of Canada, some of the warmer parts of Vancouver Island and places like that. I'd have to check that out, but uh, kind of just one of those warnings. If there's, <laughs> there is a mushroom out there named death cap, and you don't want, you know what you're doing. You don't want to eat any wild mushrooms. Uh, I do have a brother-in-law that collects some wild mushrooms, and I've known a couple of people that kind of got into it, and and uh, and I guess you can you can easily learn what you're doing, but uh, I, I, I don't think I'm going to trust myself to do so. I'm not a much of a enthusiast. I'll eat them on pizza and once in a while they're very tasty, but I'm not going to go out of my way to eat something that could have the name death cap on it. So molds are um, kind of uh, fuzzy mushrooms, right? So remember those hy hyphae and those mycelium we were talking about? So you can imagine there being thousands and millions of these things and it, it just makes it look fuzzy. And so this is what we see when we see moldy food. We see these hyphae all over the place. So there's a moldy, it looks like it's an orange or something like that. And uh, uh, this is a huge part of food spoilage. And uh, this is something that we think of a lot in the food industry. And of course, if you're cleaning out your fridge. And so uh, you can see there, and, and some of them uh, are harmless. Some of them produce toxins. Some of them actually produce medicine. So we're gonna talk later about penicill penicillin, which is produced by this organism here, this penicillium, which I should have in italics. Uh, and so, Lots of uses of these in other products. There's another uh, picture. I thought that one was just a really amazing piece of photography. So I thought I had to share it with you. So let's talk a little bit about molds. Uh, how do they get there? Uh, they get there by spores. So this is why you can have a perfectly good piece of food and the mold, you know, just magically appears, it seems like, because these little spores can travel throughout the air uh, beyond dust particles and things like that. Uh, so here's the spore, it'll grow, and you can see it's forming these hyphae, and actually some of them can be quite beautiful. You can see this one here, it, it, it really looks, uh, it's very gorgeous. Uh, that's the actual color and everything of the penicillin. So I think I have a video here I want to share with you, because here's always the question, right? If the food is moldy, which part is safe to eat? So I found this actually video, it's important, so I'm going to play this for you. You're all ready to make the sandwich of your dreams. Turkey, tomato, and Swiss on a bed. Kind of what he's talking about is, you know, that little part of the mold you see, uh, just like the mushroom, there can be quite a bit more in there. So any soft food, fruit or bread, throw the whole thing out. Don't even trust the whole loaf is what he's saying there. Uh, some of the harder foods like cheese, you're probably fine with cutting it off because it doesn't permeate very far. Uh, but that was kind of the bottom line. And they were just talking about how some molds do have toxins in them and, and can make you ill. Uh, so you don't want to trust it. Um, so I think really, really he said, cheese might be the only thing that's safe. And he said, cut about a centimeter or two away from the mold uh, if, if you're so inclined to keep the cheese. Uh, I've done that hundreds of times. You know, you buy these big blocks and, you know, happens all the time and I, I cut it off. Never even thought anything about, about it until I saw this video. Although bread, I could just, I always, you know, I'm, I'm very picky about bread. It has to be super fresh. Um, so, you know, with mold, I, I would throw it all out. So I was glad I was doing the right thing. <laughs> um, okay, let me just get this to the next one. So, 
Oh, okay, this is the PowerPoint, yes. Why does it want to go to the next slide? Unicellular fungi. So one cell, um, they're kind of round like. Uh, some of them, of course, you probably know it was used in bread and wine industries and things like that. And there are some that can cause infections. Uh, yeast kind of generally don't do mitosis like a normal cell. Or if you think about mitosis, where you have two cells, they divide, and you got two daughter cells that are um, are kind of equal in size. Uh, yeast actually divide usually by budding. So that means that the, that one um, one cell is big and one daughter cell is kind of just a little junior cell, right? So uh, if you take a look right here on the slide, you can see some of these smaller cells kind of biting off. So it is just a different form of, of mitosis where literally one half gets all the goodies and the other half gets the bare minimum, but the genome is still shared. So the little one grows off it basically the little one grows off, so it's kind of an unequal mitosis. You know, you still get the uh, you still get the DNA, but you just don't get the the lion's share of the cytoplasm and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. So that's called budding. So there are some important yeast infections. Uh, kind of the main one that uh, most people get uh, some sort in their lifetime, uh, or uh, and, and usually not too serious, is uh, the one called Candida albicans. Uh, so this yeast here, I don't have a name. Oh, I do have the name on here. Candida albicans causes uh, yeast infections. So by yeast infections, uh, there's there's a few different types. Kind of the main two types are thrush and vaginal yeast infections, and it's caused by the same uh, organism. So who gets thrush, by the way? Babies. Pretty common in babies. Um, sometimes people that are immunocompromised, uh, so maybe they have AIDS or something like that. Uh, normally, we have um, a huge complement of different organisms in our mouth, for example. Uh, so a lot of bacteria are kind of the, the majority of the organisms in there. Babies are not like fully colonized, so sometimes what happens is that the yeast just sort of gets a chance to thrive. But it is a normal part of our, uh, our, our mouth flora and our skin flora and the vaginal flora. Uh, it's kind of a normal organism, and we get uh, you know, these infections when it just has a chance to kind of overgrow. So we'll talk a little bit about vaginitis um, in some later units here or there. But like I said, it's a normal part of the vaginal flora. And um, there are some scenarios where people might uh, get vaginal yeast infections. Uh, sometimes they just happen. Um, but a pretty common case is where people are taking antibiotics or something. So let's say you have pneumonia. And pneumonia is usually caused by a bacterial organism. And so the person gets uh, antibiotics. And the antibiotics, uh, you know, they kill bacteria, so they're they're wiping out kind of a lot of the natural bacteria uh, on that person's and in that person's body, and so now the yeast has a chance to thrive, and then the person gets some vaginitis from vaginal yeast infection. So that's kind of a typical scenario where someone might get might have a, a yeast infection, uh, and it's because it's not susceptible to the penicillin because it's not a bacteria. So, like I said, a little bit more on, on this later. There's someone with thrush. Uh, you can see thrush has a very um, uh, kind of pasty look to it. Uh, apparently pretty easy to recognize. I don't know if it has a distinct smell, but I think I heard that once. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if I've actually seen thrush. Uh, maybe in mild cases uh, uh, on, on my son, um, but I, it wasn't like, like this crazy, right? So there are some yeast infections out there that are super dangerous, and I'm starting to hear a little bit more about them. Uh, and there's there's a few species, and they're not common, um, but it does happen once in a while. And I was reading on this one here; it's called uh, Cryptococcus neoformans. So coccus, it's round, like all yeast. So I don't know who named it. Uh, crypto, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but this one here apparently is found in bird feces, particularly pigeons. So uh, this is uh, happens once in a while in places where uh, sometimes old buildings 
have pigeons in them or newer buildings. I actually lived in a student housing years ago and the pigeons there were, I don't know, they, they liked it. <laughs> uh, they're all over the place and uh, pigeons are, are pretty messy and uh, you know, with their feces everywhere. And so this is common in, in buildings that are in, in disrepair and uh, sometimes with, uh, with homeless people who are getting uh, exposed to the feces and whatnot and it gets in the lungs and uh, lung infections can be particularly nasty. Uh, don't know a ton about this one, but I just was introducing it as a fact that there are other infectious um, uh, fungal yeasts. Uh, there's another one that can cause blood infections that I'm hearing about here and there, also a candida strain, but we're not gonna cover everything in this class. So what is this last one I talked about, these dimorphic, right? So di means two and morphic means shape. So here you have a species that can grow as a yeast type or they can grow as a, as a mold type. So by the way, you may notice in my notes mold, I'm spelling it two ways. That's not intentional. You can spell it either way. Um, I think M-O-L-D is the American way and M-O-U-L-D is the British way and we're Canadians and we just compromise, right? Um, so I, I, I think I usually spell it without the U but uh, it looks like I spelled it with the U here as well. So either way is acceptable. I'm fine with either. Um, you don't you need to use the Queen's English. You don't need to be American either. It doesn't really matter. Um, so you can see here it's yeast-like at one temperature, so higher temperatures. Um, so what's 37 degrees? That's body temperature, yeah. And then at cooler temperatures, so 25 degrees, which is more like uh, a room temperature, it's going to be it's mold-like. And so. Uh, uh, this uh, maybe the most significant um, organism that falls in this category is Blastomyces. Again, there are a few of these that are dimorphic. And uh, this one here, this particular organism is found in soil and, um, and old logs and things like that. And I think, I thought I had a map. I do have a map. And you can see it's found all over the place. So if I'm looking at this map, I'm thinking we're just a little more north than its natural range. I'm not entirely sure, but it is found in many parts of Canada. And like I said, found in um, soil and, uh, and, and old, um, old logs and things like that. And uh, so sometimes people get, uh, get these infections. And uh, unfortunately, they can be lung and, uh, and blood infections. Uh, and it happens once in a while. Again, it has to do with conditions often associated with uh, old condemned buildings. Uh, you know, you can imagine, you know, mold getting into walls and things like that. This is not your typical mold that you'd find like in your bathtub or whatever, but in older buildings it can be. Uh, no, tetanus is caused by a bacterial organism. Yeah, a good question, yeah. Uh, so quick note on tetanus. Um, there's a lot of ideas around tetanus in terms of, you know, it being in like rusty metal or things like that. Again, it's a soil organism. It can be found anywhere. You know, the association with rusty nails, it's just it's usually they're laying around the dirt, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about some of the infections that we can get from these things. So I introduced you to, I guess, about three species there that cause specific infections, right? Candida causes yeast infections. Blastomyces um, can cause a lung and sometimes blood infections. But usually with fungal infections, there's thousands and thousands of species, and very rarely do we ever diagnose the actual species. Um, there's just so many. And uh, the good news is most of them are causing um, relatively harmless skin infections. Uh, it might be itchy, might cause a rash. In most cases, it's not something that's gonna be life-threatening. Uh, and usually we just call these mycoses, right? So mycoses, myc means fungi, and then um, disease of, right? Is kind of what we're looking at. And, and sometimes they're just described in terms of where they're found, right? A cutaneous mycosis right, is of course in the skin somewhere, right? Um, systemic means blood infection, uh, those kind of things. Subcutaneous means a little bit deeper in the body. Superficial kind of means on the, um, you know, sometimes people, uh, I, I don't know what this is, but um, has anyone ever noticed, you know, when you, when you Google things, sometimes ads pop up? Yeah. So think around last year this time, I was looking for something on fungi and then for weeks afterwards, I kept getting these ads about uh, what you can do about your toe fungus, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Um, I mean, it, 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 I can't believe how many times, you know, these robots or whatever, you know, at Google do this to you, right? Um, I mean, um, <laughs> but yeah, so superficial is, you know, those kind of things, right? 
Uh, here's, here's a few of the species. This is from a table, I think, in the textbook, and you can see there's a whole bunch of different species. Often we're not, uh, we're not even uh, classifying it, um, and uh, often it's just, okay, the person has a fungal infection on the foot, uh, and the, him or her is itchy, and, uh, you know, we just call the athlete's foot, and they get an antifungal, um, and it goes away, and, and there's not even culturing or anything like that. Uh, but there's a whole bunch out there that are uh, significant in certain settings. You know, particularly if somebody is an AIDS patient, there's a lot of fungal infections that can be very serious that are not harmful to the, uh, the common person. But we're not going to learn all of these. Uh, so another term you might see is tinea, right? And so um, often this term is followed with something to do with the body part. And I think this is just somebody's attempt at, you know, Latinizing things so that you're not necessarily using English or German or French or whatever. Uh, and, uh, but in the end, right, you can see tinea pedis, right? That means fungal foot infection. I've never heard anybody use that word out loud. <laughs> I always heard people just call it athlete's foot, right? And there's a few other things out there like, uh, Jock itch, you can imagine, you know, what body part that is found and so on. Um, and so usually we're saying, you know, it's a, it's a skin fungal infection or mycosis or something like that. But you might see some of these terms as well, right? And again, it just has to do with the, uh, the part of the, of the body um, that is found. Uh, another term, one more term for you that you may also hear is ringworm. So ringworm is not a worm. So I don't know why... I don't know. Huh. Uh, again, you know, I don't, I don't get to choose to how to name everything. Uh, I would have done it differently. Um, but why is it called ringworm? Because the rashes often look like rings. And this is just a fungal skin infection. Uh, I remember um, my brother-in-law, uh, when he was like uh, about 14, um, had this on his chest, right? And, uh, you know, we were at the lake and his, uh, his mother, uh, my mother-in-law is, uh, you know, kind of a typical mother. She was really fussing over him, right? And and like a 14 year old boy <laughs> does not respond well to his mother fussing over him. It was her trying to get him to the doctor and him not wanting to go. And it, it got worse, and he did have to go eventually. But it was it was kind of an interesting kind of scenario. So you know, people will often scratch and they're scaling. And you see, there's some athlete's foot there. Um, that's pretty nasty looking. I've had athlete's foot a couple of times. Um, I just remember being super, super itchy and, uh, you know, I went to the doctor and the antifungal actually, I felt like it worked like, uh, that day. I mean, it was amazing how quick it worked. Um, but the more you scratch, the worse it gets and the more scaling you might get. Mine was not that bad. That's pretty nasty looking, but, um, that's you know, part of the, part of the process of that inflammation and the itching and all that going on. So ringworm, remember that's a fungal infection. Okay, not a worm infection, because we are going to talk about worms today. Okay, so don't, don't forget that what a ringworm is. It just means kind of the shape of the rash, right? There's some more pictures of some ringworm. Nice close up there for you. Um, you know, lots of different rash types out there. Okay, so we've got a quick case study for you, and that's kind of mostly what we're going to talk about fungi. Uh, kind of the bottom line about fungi is that most fungal infections are not serious. Most fungal infections are not diagnosed. They just, you get an antifungal. Kind of the two most common ones, people get a skin infection or, uh, or thrush or vaginitis, right? All those are, are pretty easily treatable, non-life-threatening, um, really annoying. Um, and that's kind of the end of it for most patients. Um, of course, anybody who's immunocompromised or old or uh, you know, getting surgery uh, could be at risk of getting a much more serious fungal infection, and uh, one of them being the dimorphic one. Uh, so you can see this one here, uh, we have a patient with AIDS, right? So right away, that means the person's immune system is uh, is not in good shape. And you can see uh, there's some description about, about what he's going through. And um, it says they did a bone marrow examination, and they found yeast. So that would be figure one here. So there's the yeast, the little round cells. And it says the patient was treated with intravenous amphotericin, I think is how you say that one. That's an antifungal. And the organism was cultured at 30 degrees. So you can see at 30 degrees, um, it's looking a lot different, right? So a couple of questions about that. What was dimorphic again? Yeah, so what happens at what temperature? 
So I'll let somebody over here. So go ahead. <laughs> Mold in one and then I the other. Mold in one and use the other. So it's usually used at body temperature. And you can see uh, figure one from the bone marrow examination, right? So that's really a body temperature. When they culture it in the lab at a lower temperature, it's, it's fungal like. Uh, it says here, I never really answered that, did I? Why is this significant in the person of age? You know, compromise. This is probably this fungal infection. If it infected someone, uh, a normal person, the person would not have any symptoms. The, the immune system would mop it up. It wouldn't even really gain any foothold. Uh, but because this man has AIDS, uh, the immune system is, is, um, is uh, compromised. And uh, this, this is actually suddenly that would something that's not a serious infection for most people has become a serious infection, especially if it gets into the blood as well. Okay. So like I said, that's kind of mostly it for fungi. We'll kind of talk about them here and there, um, but uh, usually not too serious kind of infection. Okay, so. How are we doing here? Okay. We're doing just fine. All right, topic five is one of my favorite topics. We have to talk about worms, uh, other parasites. They're, they're super interesting. I would mean, go on forever about these, but uh, we're going to try to keep it limited um, to some certain types. I uh, probably won't quite finish this today. Um, I've already gone a little overtime on some things, but uh, we're going to see some parallels with the worms that we've already brought the other organisms. Um, with, with some, some, some differences, right? Uh, probably the obvious one is that they're not always microscopic. Some of these things are massive. We're kind of going back on the things we talked about before. I had mentioned, you know, this whole concept of parasitology, right? So technically, we see ology. That means the study of. Parasite means the study of parasites. So. Technically, that could mean all things that are causing disease, right? Because, you know, they're benefiting at our expense. Medically, though, that's not usually what we talk about. Medically, when people say they have a parasite, they mean a person has a worm or a protist, right? So we already talked about the protist. So if you, if you end up with Giardia, you have a parasite. If you end up with Trichomonas, you have a parasite, and so on. Um, but also we have the worms. So you can see that, that kind of the older terms we use is protozoa. I mentioned what a protozoan is. A protozoan is an animal-like protist, so it usually means it has a flagella and can move around. Uh, metazoa is an old term that means animal, right? So, uh, and it's kind of, it hasn't really stuck around in, in most biological circles, but in the medical community, people may talk about uh, somebody has a metazoan infection or a metazoan parasite or something like that. So by animals, uh, like I said, most of these are worms. Um, you could talk about ticks or leeches or lice, and uh, we'll kind of mention a few of those, those as well here today. So two types of parasites, um, endo and ecto. What is endo? Inside. So then what do you think ecto means? Outside, yeah. So uh, lice. For example, is a good example of an ectoparasite, something that's outside. Uh, so the ecto ones is probably what we're not going to cover today. We're going to try to cover the endoparasites today. So I have this uh, broken into um, a few different kind of classifications. You can see we have uh, um, the helminths. So helminth means worm, basically. Okay, a fancy term. It's the you know biological term that means worm. And there's different types of segmented and non-segmented. Uh, once you can see there's there's technical terms for them like nematodes are non-segmented uh, and uh, the analita are um, what do we call these segmented brown worms. But kind of the big one we're going to focus on here is the first one. Um, definitely going to cover that today are the flatworms. So flatworms you can see are called the platy helmets. Um, fine if you just want to call them flatworms. And so we're talking about tapeworms and flukes. Uh, and then uh, next day. 
uh, we'll probably talk about the insects and arthropods. So we'll get, get there in a minute, in a bit. So one thing about these, I think I mentioned before, is that uh, many of these have life cycles that look like other parasites. They might have a microscopic part of their life cycles. Their eggs can be uh, not visible to the human eye, um, but they can also be huge. So if you take a look at this, what we're looking at is this fish. This fish was cut open and inside was a fluke. And you can see that the worm is almost as long as the fish. Some of these are absolutely massive, these parasites. Um, not all of them, just some of the more impressive ones. All right, so another thing to talk about, and I kind of hinted on this when we were talking about malaria, is that uh, many of these worms can have very complex life cycles. Uh, so if you remember with malaria plasmodium, it had uh, two hosts. What were the two hosts for, for malaria parasites? Mosquito and an animal, so humans, right? Um, so some definitions for you. Uh, some of the hosts are what we call definitive hosts. So what is the definitive host? That is kind of the, um, I'm not going to say the main host, because in the case of plasmodium, you need both the human and the mosquito for that thing to survive. Um, but this is the host where, where the organism matures and matures sexually, right? So sometimes you talk about the, uh, the host where the organism is the adult form, right? And so uh, sexually transmission, it, or sexually uh, uh, reproduction, I mean, uh, means that you have a male and female uh, gametes. Sometimes it's in the same organism. Sometimes it means you have female male worms. Uh, so we'll see some examples of both of those. So the intermediate host is usually the other host, the one where it has another part of the life cycle. So some sort of larva or juvenile stage, and uh, it may or may not reproduce there. Sometimes there's some asexual reproduction uh, sometimes it just grows. So it starts off, maybe it hatches there as an egg and turns into a little worm before it gets to the other host. So we're going to see some examples of these types of hosts. Uh, sometimes people will use other terms uh, for hosts. They might talk about like an accidental host. So in the case of, um, for example, swimmer's itch, which we'll talk about, uh, we're not the main host for that organism. We're just an accident and then we get it and it really sucks. You get itchy. Um, so we'll come back to that too. So let's take a look at some examples, okay? It becomes a little bit more clear when we take a look at examples. So I want to take a look at the uh, the tapeworms first. And the tapeworms, um, we're going to talk about two tapeworms, the beef tapeworm and the pork tapeworm, right? So these are called Tinea, that's the genus, and we've got Saginata and Solium um, because we've got two different species we're talking about. So commonly we call them the beef and the pork tapeworms. You probably know which animals they're associated with. Beef being cows and pork being pigs. Exactly. Yeah. So usually if they're named carefully, they're in the uh, in the name. So there's kind of something different going on with both of these, and we'll get to them in a moment. But in both of these cases, the definitive host is humans. So that means that in the human, you have the adult stage, right? The adult stage that can reproduce sexually. And in the cow or the pig, you have uh, a juvenile state. Okay, so let's take a look um, at the beef tapeworm first, and I'll show you the life cycle. Very fascinating. Oh, the other thing is sometimes something weird can happen with the pork tapeworm is that the human can be both hosts. We'll get to what that means because that's actually very dangerous. So here's the beef tapeworm, right? So you're eating beef, okay, and uh, it's undercooked. And uh, so that particular cow um, has a cyst. So there's that word again. Remember I told you it means lump. In this case, cyst means where the uh, a juvenile worm is uh, encased in a membrane and it's just hiding in the tissue somewhere. All right, so there it is in the meat. It can be anywhere in the meat. Um, apparently they like softer tissues, so the tongue. Um, I, I, don't, I don't eat beef tongue, I don't think. <laughs> um, who knows what's in those hot dogs. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, uh, it's it's not cooked properly, and I think the temperature, do I have it on there? I do have it on there. I was going to say 56 degrees. So if the beef has not been cooked sufficiently, um, the worm can survive. So here's somebody eating that beef, and um, and now you have, uh, they're ingesting that worm, and it goes to uh, the digestive system, right? 
So once it hits the human digestive system, you can imagine going through there, you've got a stomach and intestines, you've got some pH and chemical chemistry going on, and the worm says, I'm home. I'm going to grow up and I'm going to, you know, establish myself here, and it does. And so it grows from being a little larval worm into this big, long um, thing, uh, this big, long segmented tapeworm. And I'll show you some pictures of, of it in a moment. And uh, each of these segments, by the way, has, uh, has testes and ovaries, so it can self-fertilize itself and produce eggs. And uh, if I remember correctly, um, it's like a few hundred eggs each, each of these. And these segments can kind of pop off. And uh, since this is a digestive system, they pop off and they go out through the stool. And, uh, and now the stool is releasing eggs. So now you have some human feces somewhere out there and it gets on some grass. And these eggs are apparently super sticky. And the, the cow uh, eats the eggs. And the eggs go into the cow gut. Now a cow gut has a different chemistry compared to humans. And, it, and, and the eggs recognize the cow gut and they, and they hatch and they become these little tiny worms, and these little tiny worms can burrow into tissues. And that's the kind of, you know, the beginning of the cycle where now the human kills the cow and eats the meat and so on. So a couple of things to point out here, right? Kind of two things around the cycle. One is cooking your meat is helpful, right? It can kill the, can kill the worm. Uh, freezing can help too. Freezing will kill most of these worms as well. So that's kind of a, uh, solved a lot of the problems uh, with this. Um, the other one is the human feces, well, I don't know, you know, the human feces in, in the cow field, right? Um, some people look at this and they're thinking, ooh, that's really gross. And, and we don't do that, right? As, as humans, not usually, we're not out there with the cows and doing that kind of thing, right? Um, but we sort of do, right? And it turns out that um, probably one to two billion people worldwide uh, we'll actually use human waste as fertilizer, right? And uh, so this is a way to propagate that cycle. Uh, now, there are proper ways to do it, and, and again, it's probably thinking gross, but we, that's what we do. We use animal waste as, as fertilizer, and humans are animals. It's rich in nitrates, and it's actually a very good fertilizer. Um, like most fertilizers, there are proper ways to do it. You can cure it, which means it kind of sits for a while and, 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 and whatnot, and, and, uh, and it can be used very effectively. Um, but if it's not used properly, right, uh, it can spread the eggs. And uh, that's what happens in many places of the world. So this here is not necessarily a disease that is, that is only a developing world, um, but most cases are. Uh, like, for example, this is not typically transmitted in Canada. Most Canadian cases of tapeworms, um, uh, the Canadian was somewhere traveling and, and ate something um, that, ha that uh, um, was not cooked properly. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about an example of this in a moment. Uh, so the two things, right? The human waste is fertilizer um, is one issue and the other is just the not cooking. So that's kind of the life cycle. Let's just talk about the worm for a minute here. There's the eggs being released in the feces. So here's some photographs of these things. Um, they are, um, you can see the segments here that are coming off and uh, uh, you know, somewhere over here is the head and I'll show you a picture of some of the heads in a moment. So one thing people are probably wondering is, okay, what happens when you get a tapeworm? So it turns out most people don't even have symptoms, right? You're not losing weight or anything like that. That's just one of those urban myths. Um, they're not taking enough nutrients to make you lose weight. Um, they're, not, uh, they're not usually causing any gastrointestinal symptoms. Sometimes I think uh, people do have some gastrointestinal symptoms because um, they are taking up space, so they might cause some cramps and things like that. But other than that, it's pretty minimal. The worst part is the, uh, the psychological trauma, right, of, I have a worm, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's what I was going to mention. This guy here, if you're looking for really, uh, a really good write-up of what it is like to get a worm infection, uh, check this guy out here. And he talks about it, and, and you know, he was, uh, he was uh, I think, in, in, in France for a while and uh, eating steak tartare. Anyone know what that is? Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, my understanding is it's ground beef and there's flavors and stuff put into it and, and it's not even cooked, right? Um, I remember seeing it on a movie once and, and my brother-in-law actually said it's delicious. Um, I, I'm not sure if I'm brave enough or not, uh, knowing too much about tapeworms. But anyway, this guy really got into it, right? And was over in France for like a year and that's apparently, it's very common to eat that there. And then one day he noticed in the toilet 
what's going on, right? Uh, and sometimes apparently comes out while you're sleeping too. So people discover them in the bed sheets and that's the worst part. And so this guy was just like, like the worm. So he's horrified and fascinated simultaneously. And so he wrote this little blog about it, right? And, uh, um, and, and here, here's the most horrifying part, right? What do you do if you get a tapeworm? You go and you get, a, you get one pill, right? And this pill paralyzes the worm and then it lets go. So now picture this and like 10 rolls of toilet paper, right? So yeah, he's, uh, I mean, you can read all about it here. So, um, so yes, but in, in um, good question, in, in Canada with sushi, so you can get parasites in fish and whatnot, in Canada, uh, legally you have to flash freeze it. And the flash freezing will kill the worms. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, you know what, most foods that we eat, particularly fish, uh, uh, fish are loaded with parasites. Yeah. So if you eat any type of fish, you're eating them for sure. So that's why we cook it or flash freeze it. You know, usually a good idea. We'll see some of the fish parasites here in a minute. So some of these things are long. So I went to the TELUS Center in Edmonton a while ago, and there's that thing on the human body showing how long the intestine is, right? So about 10 meters. So that's like about here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, somewhere around here, right? So that's how long this worm can be, the entire length of the intestine. And there have been cases where people have found the worm that is held on and it's, it's gone the entire length of the intestine and then it's folded back and gone double, right? So there have been cases of 20 meter long tapeworms found in humans. Now, if you think that's horrifying, think about how long tapeworms in like a blue whale might be. Yeah, I was reading about that a few years ago. It was like, I mean, just crazy. I don't remember the numbers, but it was just like my mind was like, holy cow, um, that is a, a very large worm. No, not all of them are this big, um, but some of them are. I had a question. Yeah. Um, so the tapeworm, like, I know that you said it goes when it's a fertilizer, the cow eats it, and then it eats the bees, and so on yeah. and so forth. But does it start in the small intestine, or does it start in the cow? Like, where did it well, start? it's a cycle, right? You know, yeah. which came first, the chicken or the egg? Like, oh, that's like the same that kind too, of question, yeah. Yeah, there was yeah. An answer. No, there's not really an answer to that. Yeah, it's, it needs cows, it needs humans. Who knows how these things arose? You know, it's very, uh, very fascinating. And there are some parasites that actually have three or four species that are required. I don't know how these things exist. Like, <laughs> just seems very complex, but it works. It's working, working for these guys. <laughs> so um, there's a, a picture of the head. Uh, apparently, that's how we identify tapeworms is by what the head looks like. So the head is called the scolex. Um, they have like hooks and suckers that uh, grab on to the human tissue and um, they have, uh, and then there's all these segments and they don't have like, um, like some worms have a tube that go through that, the, you know, so it eats food and food goes on the inside. These things actually absorb nutrients on the outside. They don't have like a, a complex digestive system like, like mammals would have. Um, they're just absorbing food. You're already breaking it down for them uh, if they're in the gut there. Uh, you can see there's some of these segments here, right? And as I mentioned, each of the segments will have uh, ovaries and testes, and they can self-fertilize. So I got another picture here showing some of these segments here. You can see we have um, the ovaries. Uh, there's the sperm duct. So that's where the, and, and all these little dots here, those are, are the testes. So the sperm can come out here and then get into, and I don't know whether the same segment hat can fertilize itself or not. I have no idea how that works. Um, but they can self-fertilize, they can make eggs, this here is a yolk sac down here, and uh, each segment can have, I think it's, uh, it's hundreds of eggs is my understanding. Uh, probably depends on the species of tapeworm. Um, the pork tapeworm and the beef tapeworm being a little different. So tapeworms, pretty fascinating. Um, there's some uh, very cool pictures of these uh, I've been finding on the internet. Um, these are some electron micrographs, and uh, you know, I can, just, I can just see the inspiration in science fiction movies on some of these things. They're just uh, kind of horrifying, but uh, if you think, I'll show you the tape or the hookworm in a minute, they're even more horrifying. Okay, so let's talk about the pork tapeworm. I told you it's kind of special um, and more dangerous, right? So the beef tapeworm, um, the worst is the psychological aspect of knowing you have a tapeworm, right? Um, that's about the worst as it gets. Now there have been cases, and I think it's really rare, and I'm not sure why some people have this happen where you can get multiple tapeworms and then you can end up with blockage and that can be a serious problem. But I think that's pretty rare. 
Um, and I think there's probably mechanisms that the tapeworm has to prevent other ones from establishing themselves. Uh, so let's talk about the pork tapeworm. Very similar life cycle, except for now the person is eating undercover, undercooked pork, right? So it's in the, it's in the pig's tissue somehow. Um, there's the person eating it. Uh, all the same stuff that we were just talking about. It, it hits the, the human um, digestive system and says, I'm home. I'm going to grow into a, an adult worm. It's going to become segmented. It's going to produce the eggs. The eggs get, uh, oh, come on, what's going on here? My mouse isn't working. And then the eggs get out. And the eggs end up in the environment. And the pig eats the eggs. And then it says, hey, I'm in a pig. Grows into the larva. The larva can burrow, like I said, in your tissue. Okay, so that's it, not quite. So here's the thing. It turns out that a pig, like a human, is an omnivore. So our digestive systems are a lot more similar than a cow and a human. So this is a problem because it means in some circumstances, a human might ingest the eggs. And we can become the intermediate host. So there are, there are um, a few different circumstances where this might happen. Um, sometimes someone is infected with the worm and uh, they can self-infect, right? So maybe they're not washing their hands well enough after going to the bathroom, right? Uh, and, and that, you know, we can judge about that, but apparently these eggs are super sticky. So apparently even hand washing can still uh, not do the job in some cases, or that same person uh, is maybe preparing food for you, right? So there was a case where this has happened. I'll show you how this works. I think I've got it on the next slide. So kind of like that, right? You have somebody who gets infected, they get an adult tapeworm, the eggs end up out there somewhere, like I said, on food or whatever, they end up being ingested by another human. And now you have those little larvae, and those little larvae, um, sorry, you can probably read here, it says they can invade tissues. So if they end up in your muscle, not usually a big deal. One or two worms in the muscle, um, not too bad. Uh, but what if they end up in your brain or your heart or something like that? Then it can be, be much more serious. Uh, so there was a case, um, um, some cases a number of years ago in New York City, and uh, it was in a Jewish community. And so this is very strange. Why is that? Yeah, they don't eat pork, right? So what was going on? So it turns out it was some wealthy Jewish family and they had hired um, uh, some catering or something like that. And so the caterer was not Jewish and was infected and had, and had gotten food. So there were like, I think four or five cases. So something unusual, but it does happen. Uh, so I wanna show you some pictures of some of these larvae, little worms in some tissues. And uh, it's not usually this bad. Sometimes it's just one or two cysts. In this case here, it looks like there's a few dozen, and uh, in the muscles, it's not usually um, a big deal, but sometimes it can cause some issues if it's kind of, you know, getting into the nerves or something like that. But there's some cases there of, of the muscles. So this is called cystocirrhosis, right? You can see it's right in the name. Cyst, meaning it's got a, um, a, a little lump, which is the uh, parasite. So the most serious case is where it gets into the brain. And this is called neurocystocirrhosis. And uh, this happens apparently uh, maybe 50 million cases of these uh, worldwide. Um, so I, I'm pretty sure the show has been discontinued. There's House, um, House MD, the medical show. I used to watch it years ago and it was on, I don't know, it was on one of the streaming services not too long ago and I was checking it out. And I watched the very first episode, they deal with this. Right, and I think they were reluctant to do the, the brain scan for a while for most of the episode, of course, because it made a good plot um, and uh, trying, you know, trying to sort of why this woman was having seizures, right? And uh, they finally did figure out what it was and did the brain scan, and, and it turns out this was the case. So this can be very significant or serious, you know, getting in the brain. And uh, so this is something that, uh, uh, that you may see in your travels. I think I have another, I have another picture here. No, I guess, I, oh yeah. No, I had another picture. 
So again, you know, this is something where you have that situation that this, these things are more common in parts of the world where human fertilizer, um, human waste might be used as fertilizer. So uh, I found this study showing, you know, showing a map of um, different parts of the world where this is a uh, most common thing. So Canada, Canada color. So Canada is low prevalence. Um, so the tapeworms are usually low prevalence in Canada. Although there are, are some cases that are imported once in a while. So there are other tapeworms out there. There's like the fish tapeworm, the dog tapeworm, the rabbit tapeworm. A lot of these things are infecting wildlife that sometimes get into humans. And there are cases once in a while. And I think I have one or two of them in, um, in the topics for the, uh, uh, the project this semester. So you can check that out. So just got to see something interesting with the fish tapeworm. I was listening to a podcast about it. And they're talking about how it used to be common in Scandinavian countries. And so it's kind of interesting to, to have this image in my head, right, of, um, of why it was common. So the fish tapeworm is mostly fish and, and bears, right? Um, but in, in Scandinavian countries, apparently it used to be pretty common. You, know, you can imagine you're living on the lake, beautiful countryside, and where do you have your outhouse? On the dock, right? <laughs> so they'd have the outhouse on the dock. And then, like, you've got all this fertilizer going through the hole. And it's a great place to fish. <laughs> so people would fish through the hole. And of course, that's the propagation of the life cycle, right? Where you have the fecal matter uh, leading you know, to the infections. But anyway, I thought that was interesting a little tidbit for you. OK, so let's switch over and talk about another type of flatworm called the flukes. OK, so flukes um, kind of look like this. They're sort of that flat shape. They come in different sizes. Um, I know we have some in the biology lab, some specimens. I meant to go get them, but I just was so busy this morning, I didn't get the chance to do it. Uh, but some of them are like tiny, and then others are like this big. And I showed you that fish fluke before that was the size of the fish. I don't know how big that fish was. And there's a whole bunch of these. They have uh, scientific names. Um, rarely people call them by their scientific names. They usually call it by the uh, organ they're infecting. So you can see this one here is a liver fluke. So it infects the liver. Uh, we might talk about the lung fluke or the blood fluke or, or, or something like that. Uh, they have sort of these flat bodies. They also have suckers and uh, that are helping to attach to the uh, uh, tissues. And uh, um, you'll see that there's some common things around their life cycle. So this is uh, kind of the biggest one worldwide. And you can imagine that since it's called the Asian liver fluke, it's common in Asia. And there's a reason why it's geographically uh, a, a geographical kind of thing. So here's the life cycle, and I don't expect you to know everything about these life cycles, but there's a few basic things to know. One, just like the tapeworms, we have ingest, ingestion of not cooked meat, right? So in this case, it's fish. And so uh, this is super common, right? Somebody mentioned sushi already. Um, and uh, in a lot of Asian countries, uh, particularly around the ocean. Fishing is like anywhere in the world, obviously. Fishing is, is really common, but uh, it's a pretty common uh, cultural practice in a lot of Asian countries uh, where the fishermen, you know, they're out at sea and they catch the fish and now you have super fresh sushi. So like they're on the boat or on the dock, they're cutting it up and eating it, right? And not cooking it at all. And so now you've eaten the meat, it's not cooked, and it has the parasite in it. So there's the fish get eaten, and then it goes into the human gut, and eventually it's uh, getting uh, releasing eggs in the feces. Uh, I just want to share something. Sure. Yeah, we just uh, we live in a uh, very uh, island. We are living in island, so the our main source of income is the fishing. Of course. Yeah. So mostly we do the the worming. Yeah. The worming, yeah. The worming, yeah. At around like six to seven years. Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Like I said, you know, if you if you pay attention, if you do fishing, um, you can find parasites very easily. Yeah. Most people don't. You know, they're kind of that part of the brain is like I don't want to think about it. <laughs> but yeah, it's pretty easy in in um, a lot of wildlife. But fish in particular, frogs is another one. Um, I was I was uh, listening to a podcast about a frog study, and and uh, you know they dissect it under a microscope, and they're like, look at all these worms, right? Yeah, we also have this kind of a frog that we use to eat. Mm -hmm. it, this, that, but it is uh, like from farm. Okay. From the right. Oh, of course, yeah. That's why we do that. Humans eat all sorts of interesting things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
so the other thing I want to point out, okay, human eating undercooked flesh of some sort. And the other thing is these eggs, they hatch and they um, infect snails. So that's the thing about the flukes is there most of them are geographically in certain areas because of the species of snails. So in this case here, you can see kind of to finish off the lice up, you got the eggs. The eggs are ingested by the snails. They hatch and they turn on these little, um, um, these little microscopic, uh, I'm not sure what they're called, it probably is the name there. Um, Surferi, I don't know how to say that. Uh, little swimming things and the little swimming things, you know, they go in the ocean and then they find a fish and they go right, right into the fish flesh. Right? They just kind of burrow in and, uh, and then they become part of the fish and get eaten again. So kind of the two things to know, or three things of any count. One, undercooked meat. Two, you've got aquatic snails. Three, usually there's some sort of other animal involved. Um, probably a fish, doesn't have to be. Not always, but um, pretty common with a lot of flukes. So this is affecting the liver. There's a, there's a picture of one there. And uh, so what kind of symptoms are you getting? Um, symptoms that uh, have to do with this thing affecting the liver. Uh, so unfortunately, the liver is really important and you end up with quite a, quite a number of different symptoms. Some are gastrointestinal, sometimes jaundice, uh, sometimes um, you have uh, uh, neurological symptoms and, and tingling and, and things like that. And you see there's a whole bunch here and you can see they're not even calling it a fluke infection, they're calling it a raw fish infection on this one here. So this is about 30 million people. And like I said, it's in parts of Asia because of course uh, those snails are found in, um, are, are relevant to this um, fluke's life cycle. So there, there are a few different species who do this. Um, this is kind of the main species here. And I don't expect you to know this, this uh, species name, okay? Uh, so I thought I'd just point that out. Uh, these are apparently really common in wildlife and ruminants. So ruminants are things like goats and uh, cows and, uh, and uh, deer and moose. And so, uh, if you know anybody who hunts, or if you hunt, um, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're cleaning the animal, uh, take a look on the liver. Uh, apparently, this is really common. I found this on the internet, um, just talking about, uh, uh, you know, dissecting uh, um, deer that people had hunted and finding flukes. And you see that this is the liver, and these are the flukes. These are really giant um, and uh, kind of really gross looking, but apparently really common. You can see there's the life cycle. This one's showing what is that a goat? And uh, same idea. You've got uh, some sort of aquatic snail. Um, there's no other. Um, there's no fish intermediate in that case, uh, but the aquatic snail and uh, and the goat eating eating them off. Uh, I guess some sort of probably wet grass or something like that. Are we going to dissect anything? No, we're not going to dissect anything. No. Yeah. If you want to bring in a moose, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, the cool thing was actually in high school, um, one of my classes, uh, we were talking about the hearts and uh, the teacher said, anyone have any hunters? And so uh, we suddenly had three moose hearts like the next oh, wow. week. And that was actually pretty cool. And, it, and they're large, so you I can, can really, you know, I, I don't know why I would know what I'd do with it. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'm not very good at dissecting. No, no, no. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Can you still eat the liver? Could you just cut out the brick or? I have no idea. Oh, okay. I imagine you can put it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what people do with these. I've never, I've never actually cleaned a, a moose or a, or a, a sheep or a, or a deer. <laughs> a lot of people in my culture eat raw liver. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's Arabic. It's only Arabic. Yeah. I don't. I'm, you know what? I, I don't mind being a little adventurous when eating these sometimes. I don't know. No, I can't do it. <laughs> Yeah, so like gooey. I, I used to have a friend, he was Korean, um, and he, uh, like he was born in Korea and then moved here when he was eight, and then kind of went back as an adult. And, uh, you know, and, and he was just talking about all the, all the things he ended up getting exposed to. It was fascinating. Yeah. That was the summer. Yeah. That's where we're from. Yeah, yeah. All right, so another fluke. The human lung fluke. So you can imagine that this is infecting the lung. You can see kind of a similar scenario here. You have a human eating something. This time it's not a fish. This time it's some sort of uh, lobster or um, or something in that particular uh, category of animal. Uh, not cooked properly. Uh, you got a, a, a snail as well. 
and uh, kind of similar life cycle. In fact, in the lungs, right? So just showing this to you as an example, like I said, you kind of have that common thing. You've got eating undercooked meat, you've got some sort of uh, aquatic snail, and uh, often some sort of other host that is involved in the, in the process, the thing that the human's eating, right? That's usually the typical scenario. And then there's the blood fluke. So one more, um, found this one on the internet, uh, somebody drawing the life cycle. Uh, this one here, there's no other animal other than the snail. And this one um, is found in certain parts. You can probably ascertain that this child is African, uh, certain parts of Africa. And uh, so human feces again, you've got the, um, the parasite infecting the snail, and then you've got that uh, little swimming um, part of the life cycle and uh, you've got, you know, kids in a water hole or something, and it just goes and you know finds their skin and burrows into the skin and starts the life cycle again and again. So again, this is something. These things are geographically found in certain areas. Question? Yeah, I think do we have to memorize the list? No, you do not need to know. Um, like I said, those three things are important, right? Eating the raw meat, the aquatic snail, sometimes another organism if it's part of the eating part. Question? Yeah. Like where they're supposed to grow, like in the intestines, only in the intestines, in the lungs. Yes, uh, usually that's the case. You know, their life cycles are super complex. So exactly how this works, um, I'm not entirely sure for this particular organism. But it burrows into the skin, and then eventually is ending in the digestive tract. So there's a process for that. I have my suspicions how it might work, um, and, and it's just based on um, like the hookworm will show you that and then how the hookworm works. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same as hookworm. I'm guessing it is. This one is called a schistosome, um, and there's a whole bunch of schistosome species out there uh, that are found in different places uh, in the world. And uh, there's one important one to know about Canada, one important schistosome. I think that's on, on uh, the next slide here. So these are important um, diseases. Um, none of them transmit in Canada, but they are important in certain geographical locations, uh, uh, Asia. In Africa, and particularly tropical locations, right, where um, you know, and where, where people are not uh, cooking food, or their you know practices aren't maybe as as, as rigid as, as you'd find in Canada. So I mentioned there is one important fluke in Canada, and this is uh, sometimes we call this the duck schistosome. So you might imagine what animals involved here. It doesn't have to be ducks; it can be other other waterfowl. What do I mean by waterfowl? Ducks and kind of related animals. So what do we have here? Geese, loons, uh, cormorants, you know, those kind of things, right? So in this case here, there's the little swimming um, part of the parasite. And you can see, just ignore the human for a second. Duck, snail, duck, snail, right? That's kind of the normal part of this life cycle. The duck is, is pooping out the eggs. Uh, it's infecting the snail. You get the little... Um, uh, the little swimming version of the parasite, it finds a new duck, and then the life cycle goes on and on, right? So you can find this, you know, this is all over the place. Worldwide, you find these things. Um, sometimes uh, people go swimming, and if you're in a place where there's lots of ducks, you know, those little parasites are swimming through the water looking for a duck, right? Here they go, okay, and then they find some skin, and they're like, yay, and then it's not a duck, right? <laughs> Um, and so it dies. It dies, you know, just in your in your skin, right? In those layers, depending on how deep it makes it, because we don't have the right physiology and chemistry for it to find a home. But what happens? We get super itchy, right? So I'll show you some pictures here. Um, you might get a little itchy. You might get super itchy. You might have an allergic reaction, which is really bad. Um, I've had swimmers itch once or twice. Um, I just remember, like, uh, I'm trying to think of how old I was, maybe 12 years old or something, went swimming and come home um, pretty itchy. My friend also that I went swimming with was really itchy, and my mom made me a bath with oatmeal, right? So I guess that's supposed to help with itching. And um, I think we went to the doctor the next day and got a lotion, and that was kind of like, it was, I mean, it was itchy for one whole day. It really sucked. Uh, but I've heard about people getting um, these allergic reactions, and that just sounds really, really awful. So not going to kill you, but it, again, like many of these things, they just suck. So that's an important uh, one in Canada because it, it's all over the place. And, and you hear rumors, you know, 
that there's a swimmer's edge at Gregor Lake or wherever, and that happens every summer. Um, I'm not entirely sure if this correlations with uh, warmer weather. I thought I heard that somewhere before. Um, I don't know. It, 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 I mean, it's correlated with ducks, right? You need, you need the waterfowl, um, and you need to have lots of them. And uh, I see them all over the place, right? I see them in the snow. I've seen them in the clear water. I've seen them at Gregoire. Um, so sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. I don't know why some years are worse than others. Uh, yeah, so like I said, these are often called ducks just to don't. Okay, I got a cahoot for you. And uh, see if we can load that up. Bro, I was not doing good last night. I literally had to search up how to split my screen. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I have no idea. And like, I thought like it would be in tip like, on the iPad, but it wasn't. I was like, oh, no. schedule here. Um, we do have other things to say about worms though. Um, as I mentioned, there's the nematodes. Those are non-segmented worms. And the hookworm we'll get to and a few others. We'll talk about lice and leeches and a few other things that'll be next day. But we'll do the good here. I think I've only got four or five questions. So it's a short one. Okay, false. So yeast is a unicellular fungi. Oh, no. <laughs> Number four, which of the following is an example of a definitive host? See all these answers here, the cow for the beef tapeworm, the cow for the pork tapeworm. Hopefully everyone knew that one's wrong. Two people, cow and pork. Nope. Um, pig for the pork tapeworm. So the pig and the cow are the intermediate hosts. That's where you have the larval state. Okay. So kind of by default, that leaves this one here. 
And uh, I mentioned last day that the plasmodium parasite, that's the one that causes malaria, um, the parasite reproduces sexually in the mosquito. All right, one more. True or false? Flukes are parasitic flatworms which possess life cycles that include both vertebrates and vertebrates.